have the pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker, Mike Schmuder. Mike Schmuder is the Mike Schmuder is the Vice President of IT Support Services at WW Granger Incorporated, a distributor of facility maintenance products. Mike has been a, with Granger for 32 years, and in his current role, Mike is responsible for maintaining the integrity of Granger's application systems, providing system support for over 15,000 users, and managing IT supplier relationships and contracts. Mike has a bachelor's degree in computer science from Northern Illinois University, and a master's degree in management from DePaul University. Mike currently lives in Buffalo Grove with his wife, Gwen, and has three wonderful daughters. He told me to say that. Three wonderful daughters. Mike is a charter, was a charter member of Figures of Speech Toastmasters Club and served as the club president in 1989. He found the close Toastmasters experience very rewarding and encourages everyone who desires to improve their communication skills to participate practice, learn, and grow. I'd like everyone to give a District 30 welcome to Mr. Mike Scooter. Good evening, Toastmasters and honored guests. All right, so in keeping with the theme, didn't know they were going to talk about Star Wars, but they put it on the table, so I'm going to tell you my Star Wars story. Star Wars came out in 1977. First time I saw Star Wars was with my ex girlfriend Things weren't going along at the time. I took her to see the movie. I liked it. She didn't. didn't go too well. Second time I saw Star Wars was with my best friend. And I talked about the fact that, no, things aren't going good with my current girlfriend. But there's this other girl that I really like, and she seems to like me. What do you think I should do? He gave me advice. He said, go out with this one. So the third time I saw Star Wars was with this group. I kind of liked it. She kind of liked it. She liked the movie. I liked the movie. The Force of the Witness. That's the woman I married. She was married for 31 years. And the Force of the Witness. So I'm here today to talk a little bit about leadership and uh, 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 from a standpoint of uh, what it takes in an organization to move ahead and to uh, create leader leadership opportunities for yourself. In an organization, there's some written rules about what it takes to become a leader. But there's also some unwritten rules about what it takes to become a leader. And there are unwritten rules that many times you don't find out about until you apply for a leadership job, or sometimes you never even never find out about it at all. So what I want to do today is talk about some of the unwritten rules about what it takes to become a leader in an organization. And for the people in the, in the room today that are aspiring to be a leader, what I want to do is kind of share what some of those rules are, those unwritten rules, and then what are some of the things that you can do to address them so they can be more effective. If you're already a manager in an organization, what I want to do for you is to share some of those also so that maybe you can more effectively work with the people that you work with to help them advance in their careers. Now, the title of my speech is Things Your Boss and Your Mom Never Told You. Now, the reason that I titled it that way is because these unwritten rules are things that probably your mom and your boss haven't talked about. Now, I, I know what you're thinking at this point. This person's been here for only two minutes, and he's already insulted my boss and my mom. Right? And so what I want to say is, yeah, so you're probably what you're thinking is, next slide, is wasn't there anyone else who could speak at this meeting? And that's probably the case. But since I'm here, I'm going to continue. We're going to go on. Let's, so let's talk about, uh, so, so let me make a bend to you for some of the things that I might have said. So next slide. I'm sure all of you have wonderful mothers. It was Mother's Day. I hope you treated them well. I hope you took them to a nice uh, brunch or dinner. I know that all of you work for wonderful bosses, bosses that care about you, that want to see you advance in your career. But even some of the best bosses sometimes don't necessarily share all the things that you need good leaders to grow in an organization, and that's what I want to talk about today. Next slide. All right, so there's a company that did some work recently to try and understand this issue. 
How many of you have heard of a little company out of Mountain View, California called Google? Anybody here at Google? If you haven't heard of them, you can Google them, they can find out what they Google decided in 2009 that they wanted to build a better man. And so what they did is they charted a project called Project Noxity. And Google's a data mining company. So what they did is they went in and they looked at their electronic records on performance reviews for people, uh, where they had employee complaints, all sorts of information about uh, electronic records about their employees or managers. And what they were looking to do is try to figure out what makes a good manager at Google. Now going into this uh, analysis, what they, their going in position was that if you're going to be a good leader at Google, the number one requirement you need to have is you need to be the sharpest technical person on the team. So if somebody comes to you and says, you know what, uh, you know, I, I have this problem, that that manager can say, hey, here's the answer to your problem and that person can train. That was their going in position. I see people shaking their heads. You're probably part of the problem. All right. So what they did is they went through and they, they came up with an analysis that said, hey, if you look at the great managers at Google, there's eight habits that we, that we see exhibited in these great managers that we want to share. And again, going into it, they said, who's got the best technical skills? They thought that was going to be number one. After their analysis, what they found is that was actually the last of the eight criteria. What they found is what made a good manager at Google is somebody that was a good coach, that actually worked with an individual to help them grow their career, that empowered the team and did micromanagement. If people knew what they needed to do, let them go, don't overmanage them. That expressed interest in the employee's success and well-being, somebody that, that cared and wanted, and wanted to understand what that individual needed so that they could help them succeed. Somebody that was productive and results-oriented, somebody that was a good communicator, that both communicated well and listened to the team, Somebody that helped the boys with their career development. Somebody who had a clear vision for the team so that they all had a sense of purpose. And then the last one on the list was they were real strong technical workers. Right? And I don't know, that's, some of it seems intuitive, but for many people uh, in business today, they still view that bottom, bottom line, you know, I need to be the expert if I'm going to be the leader, as the primary criteria. In today's day and age of leadership, that's important, but it's not the most important thing. The most important thing is to be able to help people uh, grow their careers by understanding what they want to do and helping them uh, achieve their goals. Now, there's one thing that American corporations do today that reinforce that last point. And that's the, the process by which we go through the performance reviews. At Granger, when we just set performance reviews, we use this thing called smart objectives. You have to be smart, measurable, achievable, realistic. You've got to have a target. And so when you set objectives, what do you normally do? You say, you want to get this work done by this time, and you want to get it done on budget, you want to get it done on the fall, right? And so what happens is, that reinforces this opinion for a person that what I need to do is I need to deliver. I need to be smart. I need to be able to uh, have the skills to deliver things on time. And as part of that, I've got to be smart technically or whatever uh, discipline I'm in to make sure that I know well enough that I can deliver on these, on these, uh, uh, on these, uh, my, on my objectives. So when a manager gets together and says, you know, here's how you did in the past year, they talk about the fact that, you know what, you delivered everything that you were supposed to deliver. And you know what, you, it was quality results and you delivered it on budget. And you know what, you actually used continuous improvement and six sigma skills to improve the process. And you were the top expert on your team. And so when they go to walk out, they say, hey, I did a great job. I'm, I'm the expert, and I got rewarded for it, and I got a great, a great, uh, uh, I got a great raise uh, in my performance. So what happens there is that an individual says, you know what, I think now that I'm at the top of my game, I can go ahead and I can be a manager. So next slide. So the manager position opens up in the, in the organization. And this individual who just got this performance review is going to interview now for that job. They just got their performance review and heard this information from their boss. And I've been in many situations where I interview people and have a very similar experience to what I'm going to share with you. As an individual who just got the performance review, and when I'll sit down, the you know, first thing I'll do is I'll ask you, so what, what makes you think you're qualified for this leadership job on my team? And the individual's going to kind of relate to things they just heard in their last performance review. I get my work done really well. I'm at the top of my, uh, the, the top, I get the top performance rating from my boss. I'm an expert in the field I work in. 
know, and that's why I think I'm ready to be a manager. I'm ready to be a leader. What I'm looking for in terms of leadership qualities are those things certain. You want to make sure that you're productive and that you can get work done. But what I'm also looking for is first, did I even know about this person before they interviewed me? Because part of advancing your career is being able to network. So did I know about this person? And what did I know about this person? The kinds of questions I'm going to ask are, how have you demonstrated your leadership skills in the job that you have today? What kind of relationship do you have with the people that you work with? How well do you interact with the management team that's going to be part of the group that you're going to work with? How well networked are you outside of your team? Now, who will you be able to call on if you have an issue that you have to work with? With the, with the team leader that you're currently working with, describe you as someone that would be a leader. So what I'm looking for in an interview when somebody's looking for an entry level position is somebody that has already demonstrated some of the skills necessary to be a leader. And so often when people go through this interview process, they, they don't get the, the leadership job because they haven't demonstrated those skills and they're not able to answer those questions. So this leads to some frustration. Why didn't I get that job? Okay. Why didn't I get it? I'm told I'm doing a great job. You know, I'm the top performer, so why didn't I get it? By the way, this is an actual picture of one of the people that I interviewed. Uh, after this, we switched to uh, Apple computers in our company because Apple is a healthier. I'm sorry, I debated on that one and I went for it, so thank you. Thank you, thank you for the example of the That's all that deserves to All right. So, what are some of the secret rules that that person that interviewed needs to know about what it takes to truly uh, create leadership opportunities for you in an organization? It's the pie principle. Any, have anybody heard of pie before? Productivity, human, and exposure? All right. It's a very powerful message that people need to understand if they truly want to create opportunities for themselves. It was created by a gentleman by the name of Harvey Coleman, who worked at IBM. Harvey was an African-American, one of three division managers at IBM. He was the, his division was always the top performing division in IBM, but yet on three different occasions, when a promotion opportunity came up, one of, his other, one of the other managers of the other divisions got the job, even though Harvey, uh, was, his division was the highest producing uh, uh, division. So what he did is he left IBM. Years later, he went back to do a study. He said, you know, I thought I was passed over uh, because of reasons other than performance. He went back, interviewed a number of people, and what he found is that while his division did a great job, that many people in IBM didn't know who he was. He was he didn't do a great job at, at networking the organization. And the image that he projected wasn't an image that fit the role that people were looking to fill. And so he came up with a concept of productivity and exposure. And the concept is this. At a base, if you're in an organization and you want to perform and you want to grow, grow your skills and, and move ahead, you got to be productive. you got to deliver. That's kind of the, the entry level things that you need what you also need to do, though, is you need to craft your image and project an image that's consistent with the level that you want to move to. Many people look at it and say, hey, I'm doing my job. This is what I want to do. And they're not looking at that next position they want to go to and crafting their image so that the people can see that, yes, that person not only is doing a well good job here, but they can do a good job in the next level as well. Third thing you need to do is you need to get exposure. You need to network. How many times have you heard people in an organization say, well, it's not what you know, but who you get to you, right? You've heard that a lot. Well, that's actually true, and that's actually one of the rules of the game. You may not like it, but that creates opportunities. So the more that you can get exposure to different settings, the people that are making decisions about who's, who's going to be leader in an organization, the more effective you can be. You can be. And it is about, uh, somewhat about, not, uh, not only what you know, but who you know, and you need to accept that as one of the rules. All right, so if you're looking to become a leader in an organization, it's, more, it's not just about productivity. It's about projecting an image that says, yes, I am an image that is consistent with that of being a leader. And it's about networking with people and establishing relationships so when a time comes, an opportunity comes up, they say, hey, I know about you. I recognize that you've got the talent and skill. I want to pull you into this interview process because I think you're somebody that I think to be a leader in our team. All right, so if those are the unwritten rules that people don't talk about, then what are the things that you can do now to start understanding those rules and being more effective? One more. All right, so there's five important messages I'd like to send about things you can do if you accept those rules. The first is understand.
understand what, you know, if you're working in an organization, understand what your leadership team requires of leaders. Uh, Google defined it for their managers. Uh, talk to your manager, talk to people in your organization or wherever you work with about what their requirements are for being a leader. Second is understand yourself. One of the key elements that all great leaders exhibit is they have a really good understanding of what they're good at and what they're not. It's really good to do self-assessments. I do what's called a 360-degree review every two years. And that's where I have surveys go out and my peers, my direct reports, uh, and uh, my boss rate me on all sorts of criteria. They say, Mike, you're doing okay here, but boy, over here, you need a lot of improvement. But those things don't actually feel good sometimes when you get them back, but they tell me what I need to work on because other people that I work with are telling me that. And the more you understand your strengths and weaknesses, the more that you can then work to develop that which you need to improve on. The third point is understand and accept the rules of the game. So many people say, you know what, it's not, who you, it's not what you know, it's, it's who you know. Well, that's absolutely right. That's the rules of the game in most organizations. Build your network. Uh, if, if there's a leader in the organization that you admire, ask, them to, ask that person to go to lunch and say, hey, I want some advice on my career. What, thing, you know, what advice would you give me to, so that I can uh, grow and advance in this organization? Go ahead and reach out. You will be amazed uh, at the people that are more than willing to spend the time to talk to you about some of those kinds of issues. So go ahead and do it. Build your network so that more people know who you are and what you're about. The fourth is then set the right uh, set the right goals for yourself in terms of what you want to develop. Don't just focus on getting at better at the job that you're doing today. Focus on developing your leadership skills for the job that you want in the future. Because if you're not doing that, you're never going to be able to get there. All right. So focus on the, the things that are going to get you where you want to go. And the fifth and final is there's nobody else that's accountable for your success but you. You can try and blame your boss and say my boss doesn't talk to me or my boss isn't doing this or my boss isn't that. Those are mostly excuses. Maybe sometimes that's true, but ultimately, you're the one that's accountable for your own growth, for your own development, your own leadership. There's things that you can do, things we've talked about here. You've got to take accountability. Now, I'll tell you, when you do it, when you reach out, when you network, when you learn, when you grow, there's nothing like it. You free yourself and say, you know what? I'm going to understand what i got to work on. I'm going to start reaching out to more people. It is amazing what you can learn. And it's amazing the friends you can make. And it's amazing the opportunity for your son. So those are the, uh, so those to me are some of the things that you can do to address some of the other rules in the organization. And again, in the theme of the meeting, I wish you the best. I wish you to go forth and prosper, which I know is a, a start of Star Trek, but I think it's a good one. Uh, but may the force also be with